let me tell you something. If, if I am ever hanging <laughs> off of the roof of my home and I am holding on to a rain gutter, I promise you, people in Dallas are gonna hear me shouting. I'm just, <laughs> I'm gonna let you know. I, lo I love that story. I love it for so many different reasons. But one of the main reasons when I saw that, I'm like, oh, that's so good. Did you hear what the owner said? I love that the owner, he, he looks at this man, he says, listen, here's the thing. Hundreds of people drive by my house every single day, but you, bless your sweetheart, you are the first person who actually stopped, you recognized that someone might need help, and you did something about it. Now, let me ask you a question. In the midst of the most wonderful time of the year, in the midst of the holiday season, do you ever just get the feeling that things are going way too fast? Do you ever just get the feeling that you're, you're going and you're rushing and the schedule is overwhelming and you have the best intentions because you wanna meet everyone's expectations, you wanna hit every party, you wanna love as many people as you can, but do you not feel a pull inside your soul, something that's just urging you to slow down because maybe something else is happening and it's small and it's quiet, but there's something more that God has for you. I get that. I keep a little, uh, keep a little, little placard by my, by my computer in my office. I heard this when I was in seminary, and I said I never want to forget it. And I don't know who said it, but the quote is this. I never want to be so busy doing the work of the Lord that I forget the Lord of the work. And when I move into this season, when I move into Advent, when I move into this Christmas season, it truly is like, I'm, I, I love Christmas. It's one of my favorite seasons, but I, I don't want to be so busy doing Christmas that I miss Christmas. So within the context of this beautiful Advent series, Unexpected, the gifts we never saw coming, I wanna talk about this one today. I wanna, buy, I wanna talk about the, the gift of, of just making room for Jesus and how essential and how important that truly is. It's so, it's so funny. I mean, I just, I, I saw that clip a week ago and I'm like, I gotta show that to my Harvest family. This one guy who was so fully present that he saw a need and he tried to do something about it. And I'm sitting in the midst of that context this week and I'm like, God, I wanna be fully present. I don't wanna miss anything that's going on in my life. And I love that Nikki, I, I, we joke about this, she can tell you what I'm preaching before I ever even tell her what I'm preaching because you just feel like whenever I'm preaching a text, God just wants to put me to the test during the week to make sure that I fully comprehend what it is that I'm preaching to you. And I feel like I pass the test most of the times, but sometimes I fail miserably and I think God just thinks it's the funniest thing. For example, this week I, I had seven days off. I took a a week off from a week ago last Thursday to last Thursday, and, and it was wonderful. I took, I took my mail off my phone. I, I disconnected from a lot of things. I said no to a lot of things, and would you believe like the world is still turning? The church hasn't collapsed. Everything is going well. It's okay to say no to some things, but Thursday, this past week, was my last day of vacation. So my daughter, who's back in town, she had a dentist appointment at two o'clock, and I said, you know what? Why don't I, why don't I take you to that appointment? I've got, I've got some time. Now, one of the things about me, and maybe it's my ADHD, I don't know, but I, I love to calendar, I love to schedule. You either love me or you hate me because I'm gonna be 30 minutes early to any appointment that I ever have to go to. My wife loves that about me. So, like, I, 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 I color coordinate my calendar, um, I zero out my inbox, I'm, I'm super on time. So if I have to be at the dentist at two, then I'm looking at my calendar on Thursday and I'm going, all right, well, here's what I have to do. I gotta leave at one o'clock so that it gives us at least 15 to 20 minutes cushion and, and I can get there on time. So my daughter and I, we leave at one o'clock on Thursday. And I'm on 45 and I'm heading south and I'm gonna take the Grand Parkway. I'm gonna go east and I'm driving south on 45 and I'm approaching the ramp, the Grand Parkway ramp, and I notice that, you know, the one that goes way up and over where you have to grip the wheel and you just pray to Jesus when you, those make me a little nervous. But I saw long distance vision 
I saw that cars were stopping at the top of the ramp. No one was moving. I don't know if it's an accident. I don't know what's going on. I just noticed that cars are really starting to back up. They're stopping. They're not moving. And here, have you had this happen? You, you see, maybe there's an accident or something is coming up, and it's like the angels, the heavens open, and there's your exit. It's right there. And you can avert. So I jetted off. It felt just like Tom Cruise. I felt so cool. God, forgive me. I should have said there's an accident. Maybe I can pray for someone. Maybe. No, no, no. I was so happy that I avoided that stop at that moment. I'm jetting on the side. I may or may not have looked up at the cars in the ramp and went, ha, ha, because I'm going to make my appointment on time. And I'm on, the side, I'm on the side road there in Grand Parkway, and I'm waiting for my ramp to get on the main road. And that's when my daughter says, Dad, what's going on? What are you talking about? And I look over here, and I see all these cars now are starting to pull over. And I see people, it was the most surreal thing, with their cell phones. And this one lady, like, down a bridge, I don't know what's on the other side. And I'm thinking to myself, this is exactly how War of the World started the movie. Like, is something, or I'm thinking rapture. Like, I, I have hearing aids. There's certain frequencies I can't hear. Is the trumpet that Jesus blew. Like, did I miss that? Are there clothes anywhere? I've seen left behind. I was a little nervous. And then my daughter says, Dad, stop. And I look, traffic had stopped on the Grand Parkway on the side. The ramp. So I stopped my car. And I gotta say, I'm a little frustrated, I'm a little annoyed. I'm looking at the clock, it's 1.35. I'm at 25 minutes, she's gotta be at the dentist at two. And I get out of the car, and right in front of me, people are getting out, and there's this giant Ford F-150 truck. Gabby, am I kidding? Like when I say there was a Texan in that truck, I'm telling you, this dude was a Texan. His hat, solar eclipse worthy, could block out the sun totally. Biggest cowboy hat I've ever seen in a man. And I walk up to him. I'm like, do you even know what's going on? Like, I'm, I've got somewhere I've got to be at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Y'all, I'm a mess. <laughs> I tell you it was my vacation. Does it sound like I was enjoying my vacation? And he looks at me. He looks at me. True story. And he said, well, you know, 41, President Bush passed away, right? His funeral was downtown this morning. And he said, you, you see... Son, do you see those train tracks right there? He's about to pass by, and we have an incredible opportunity right now just to stop and to pay our respects. I saw the news that morning. Like I knew, but I didn't know that that's what was going on. And I got to say, that was one of the most powerful moments, just standing on this road. Traffic completely stopped. Standing, it was surreal. It was like something out of the the news that you saw 50, 60 years ago. Standing was just strangers. But this powerful moment that underneath was happening the whole time, and I was trying to take every exit available, every moment to bypass it, but yet here's a moment where I fully stopped and it registered to me, whoa, I could have actually missed this. So for me, That's Advent. For me, that's this season. For me, this is this pull that God is just reminding us. I feel like he's beckoning us. Revelation 3.20, what does Jesus say? I stand at the door and knock. I knock. And if anyone listens, if they hear, then they'll open the door and I will be with them like he's knocking every day. The question is, are we allowing ourselves these moments of just making room for him? What does that even look like? If you have your Bibles, why don't you open them up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter two. Last week, Susan talked about the journey, the joy of the journey, Mary and Joseph. It was so good. And when I was looking at this week, I thought, well, you know what? I'm gonna preach on the innkeeper. I'm gonna preach on the innkeeper in the nativity story because I've never preached on him before. I've never talked about the innkeeper before. So I said, that's gonna be really fun. I'm gonna dig in. I'm gonna exegete. I'm gonna study it. Now, I learned something absolutely amazing about the innkeeper. If you're a note taker, you're gonna wanna write this down. Write down innkeeper. Right next to it, write down dash. And then write this word down. Nothing. (laughs) There is absolutely nothing in the scripture about the innkeeper. Did you know this? Like, there's more questions than there are answers. For example, 
Let me read it. King James. Susan set the precedent. You even talked with a deep voice when you talked about King James. So listen, Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Here's all you got on the innkeeper. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. That's all we have. We don't know anything about the innkeeper. There's more questions than answers. Was the innkeeper inconvenient? Susan referenced this last week. There was a census. Bethlehem, small little place, not even a Dairy Queen or a stoplight in Bethlehem. True story. Small place with the census, it was overcrowded. We don't know when Mary and Joseph, when they knocked on the door, if, if the innkeeper was rude If the innkeeper was just busy and didn't have time to deal with this moment of frustration, we know nothing. I love that I was talking to a friend of mine about preaching on the innkeeper this weekend. And he said, you know know what all I know about the innkeeper? I was like, what? He said, in his little church growing up, they would do like this church nativity play, a little children's nativity play every year. And he said, there was a guy in my, in my church community, his name was Mr. Smith, and he loved the Lord. He said, I know he loved Jesus. His face just didn't always show it sometimes. But Mr. Smith, his only job every year, he loved this part, he would play the innkeeper. And he said, this is my picture of the innkeeper. Every year, Mary and Joseph would go and they would knock on the door and this was Mr. Smith's moment. He said he would throw open the door and he would say, no room. And he would slam the door and he was done. He would retire for the next year. It was his part. He would never let anyone else have it. He said, that my, my image of the innkeeper is just this cranky, cantankerous guy that just refuses room to Mary and Joseph. Well, we don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Or you know what? Maybe the innkeeper was the very one who said, listen, I am so sorry. My heart hurts for you. There's a lot of places I'd love to put you, but I don't know. But I do have one place. I do have one place. It's small. It's not great but it would at least provide you a place to be. We don't know, but here's what we do know. Standing in 2018, standing in this moment today, if the innkeeper could tell us something, I think it would be this, that the greatest gift we could give ourselves this season is to make room for Jesus in our lives. It's to make room for Jesus. That's what we're, that's what we're, that's what we're called to do. So to know that then, to make room for Jesus, how do you do it? That's where I've been this week. I'm like, all right, Lord, how do you do it? And I sort of settled on this. If you really do want to take a note on this, then write this down. To make room for Jesus, I think you start here. You have to eliminate the hurried moments in your life. You have to eliminate them. You got to fight for them. You got to fight for still moments. And how do you do that? Well, I think I would start here. You take a cue from God. And why is that? Because God, think about this, God's never in a hurry. You know that to be true, right? Don't you just love that about the Lord? I mean, you know, we got a schedule. We got somewhere we got to be. Oh, man, Lord, I got a prayer request. I got something going on in my life right now, and I really need you to exegete. I need you to get to this, execute this as quickly as possible. But God really, God has a plan And the truth is, we're called to trust him so fully that here's where we're called to live. You know where the hardest place to live is? It's this way. It's this place right here. That moment. The hardest place to live is this place right here. It's this moment. Because the past, we spend a lot of time in the past. Thinking about would have, could have, should have, all the things we could have done. Maybe the innkeeper, 30 years down the road, figures out, wait, I denied the son of God, a place to sleep, you could spend a lot of time in the past. You can spend a lot of time in the future. Some of you right now, you're already worried about Monday. You're listening to me with your ears, but you're already obsessing about something that's coming Wednesday, Thursday, next weekend. It's easy to invest in the future. But to eliminate the hurried moments is to fight to be so fully present right here and right now that we're just experiencing God, that we're inviting God in. God has a plan. I mean, even when you think about Luke chapter 2, verse 7, I love NIV says, and when the time came, Mary gave birth to a child. and They wrapped him in swaddling clothes. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says this, look. 
But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. That first phrase, but when the set time had fully come. Why? God had a plan. And that's the beauty of Advent. The beauty of Advent, we use these church words a lot. Maybe you hear these words and you don't quite know what these words mean. Look, I grew up in a church, wasn't a bad church, but we didn't talk about these seasons, these liturgical seasons. Like when I got into the Methodist church 22 years ago, my understanding of Lent was that was something you took out of the dryer or your dryer would catch fire. That's what my mama taught me. That's not what Lent is in the season of church. And Advent is this beautiful season that we're standing in the midst of now. Don't, don't, Don't miss this. The beauty of Advent is It's the four Sundays, the four Sundays, leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And we look back at a dark time in our life. We look back on the Christmas story. I have one page that separates the Old Testament and the New Testament, just one. But that one page, your one page in your Bible, that's symbolic of over 400 years of people waiting, 400 years of silence, 400 years of God's people going, did we miss it? Is the Savior truly coming? God, have you given up on us? Advent is looking at a dark time where all of a sudden, in a small and quiet way, the light of the world came into humanity. We look back at the Christmas story, but we don't stop there. And we'll talk about this in a couple weeks because we also look forward. Advent reminds us that just as God came then, Jesus said, don't miss this, I'm going to come Again, there was hope then, there is hope for our future, so therefore we know that there is hope in our life today. It's to trust God, to make room for Jesus, it's to trust him fully, it's to trust that his ways are not our ways, his plans are greater than our plans, he's working in ways that we see and in ways that we don't, and we have to be so fully present in the moment that we just don't miss it. That's the beauty of Advent. That's what I need to remind myself of every day. There's a a pastor by the name of Alfred Delp. He was a Catholic Jesuit priest who was appointed, a German priest who was appointed to this this parish and actually was arrested, was arrested for speaking out against Hitler, him and several other people. And he was shackled and he was chained in prison for three and a half years before he was martyred, before he was executed for his faith. And there's such a fascinating story in this man. I'm reading one of his books called Advent of the Heart. And this very book is a series of letters that he was able to write while he was in chains, while he was shackled. He was able to write these out and to slip them out through a guard and to get them back to his parish so he could encourage his people that there was hope in the midst of dark times. And he was fascinated with Advent. He didn't just celebrate Advent four Sundays a year, like he lived a life that was in awe of Advent. And this is what he said, this is so good. I think it's one of the best definitions of Advent that I've ever read. He said this, Advent is the time of promise. It is not yet the time of fulfillment. We are still in the midst of everything. Space is still filled with the noise of destruction and annihilation, the shouts of self-assurance and arrogance, the weeping and the despair and the helplessness. But listen, but round about the horizon, the eternal realities stand silent in their age-old longing. There shines on them already the first mild light of the radiant fulfillment to come from a far sound of first notes as of pipes and voices, not yet discernible as a song or melody. It is all far off still and only just announced and foretold, but it is happening today. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you love that? It's far off, but there's hope and it's happening right here, right now. And I don't want to run the risk of missing it. Making room for Jesus in our life, it simply means eliminating the hurried moments. It's trusting in God's greater plan for our life. And what's interesting is, 
I go back to one of my seminary classes that I took, and spiritual formation, Reg Johnson was the, was the, the professor, and I love Reg, I love spiritual formation. These classes in seminary for me were just these sweet, sweet moments of Sabbath and retreat, drinking these deep wells. It's all about, spiritual formation is about the disciplines, fasting, prayer, um, really digging in deep roots in your relationship with the Lord. And Reg made this comment, that I wrote down, and I'll, I'll never forget it. He said, in relationship to Jesus, when you look at the life of, of Jesus, just in the Gospels, maybe if you've never read it, if you pick the Gospels up and you read the story of Jesus, you see who he was, you see how he lived, one of the things that you learn is that Jesus, fully God and fully human, and God gave him one task, and that was to save the entire planet. It's a big deal, right? One task. Save humanity. And what we know about Jesus is we know that he was around the age of 30 when he unrolled the scroll and read from Isaiah and basically said, hi, Jesus, fully God, fully human. I'm here, surprise, looking forward to our time together. God bless you, thank you. And then he rolls it up. That's the MIV, the Mark International Version, a little different, but that's exactly what happened. And then you have three years of Jesus' life, three years taking on the task that was given to him by his father to save humanity and to save the planet. And Reg looked at the class and he said, did you notice something about the way that Jesus lived in those three years? Here it is. Jesus never ran anywhere. He never ran anywhere. Jesus never rushed. In fact, when you really look at the life of Jesus, what do you see? He almost did the opposite, right? Like there were these moments that Jesus was walking. He had a central focus. He knew the cross was in front of him, but he was fully present with people. He was fully present with the disciples. And there were moments that he would disconnect. There were moments that he would spend time with his heavenly father. He would refill. And then he was back and he was fully present with people. And he was with his father. Jesus never ran anywhere. Why? Because God had a plan for his life. He trusted that plan. And when we as the children of God can learn to so fully dig deep roots into who God is, to spend time with him. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. But apart from me, you can't do a thing. So when we spend that time, all of a sudden, it changes your perspective. It changes the way that you see people. It changes the way that you interact with people. And it changes the way that you spend time at the feet of, of Jesus. And I, I, don't, I don't think there's a greater story that tells this one than this moment in Luke's gospel, chapter 17. Maybe you've heard it. Now, on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Can you imagine the scene? And when he saw them, Jesus said this, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were given the most amazing gift. They were cleansed. They were healed. They were healed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, actually came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And I believe it caught Jesus' breath. Jesus said, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And the 19, don't miss this. And then he said to him, rise and go, for your faith has made you well. The actual word there is rise and go, child of God, for your faith has made you whole. I wrote in the margin of my Bible this, too often we're content to enjoy the gift but to forget the giver. Advent, this season, it's a wonderful season 
It's an incredible time to gather with family and friends. It's an incredible time to go and to celebrate what God has done, what God is doing. But it's also a very important time. Number one, to be reminded of the gift that we've been given, the gift of salvation, the gift that came 2,000 years ago, the gift that is here for us now, and the gift that is to come. And it's to place this back at the feet of Jesus and just say, thank you. I'll end with his quote, Max Licato. He wrote this. I, I love his books. I love his reading. I love his preaching. And he wrote this little small book. It's called Because of Bethlehem. And this is what he said in relationship to the innkeeper. And maybe he missed, it, missed, the, missed the moment to, to give Jesus, to give Mary and Joseph a room because he was busy. And he said, one of the things I know about life is that we all get busy sometimes. If Jesus stands at the door and knocks, maybe with the best of intentions, we go to open the door to let Jesus in, but the alarm goes off on our phone. Something happens with the calendar, and all of a sudden, before we know it, we're off and we're spinning again. This is what he said. Life is crowded. Your life is crowded. Heaven knows you already have more than you can do. And listen, because heaven knows Jesus comes, not with a list of things for you to do, but with a list of things he's already done for you and will do for you. Your death, been defeated. Your sins, they've been forgiven. Your fears, he'll give you courage. Your questions, he'll guide you. Listen, Jesus lifts burdens. He's not in the business of adding to them. So church, will you join me? in a little Advent conspiracy this season. We control the noise. What does it look like to make room for Jesus? Maybe, maybe it's as simple as with your family doing a devotional. At the end of the day, you just read a devotional, an Advent devotional that takes you up to Christmas. Maybe it's as simple as just turning off the TV. It's gathering the family, letting the light of your Christmas tree illuminate the room, and just asking this single question and have everyone in your family answer it. Where did you see God today? I'm telling you, when you do, it's amazing the attitude of gratitude. It's amazing how all of a sudden we're so fully present that we sense and we know God is here. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for this message. Thank you for who you are, for what you're doing. And Lord, I just pray over my friends that have gathered in this space today. Um, Lord, I just pray that we could push back a little bit on the noise in our lives and to so fully trust that you have a plan. God, you're so good and you're so gracious. You're placing holy moments, I believe, around us every single day. So, Lord, I thank you for the gift of Jesus. I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you that you stepped into the world so fully and so completely that you look at us every day and say, beloved, forgiven, redeemed. Lord, I don't wanna just take this gift and not thank the giver. I wanna take opportunities and moments to say thank you. So we, as your people, we thank you, Father, for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you're going to do. May you be given all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And God's people said, amen.